Well, hello and welcome to the Newspapers, the Week in Review. This is the show where we look at the newspapers. My name's Mike Mendoza, and each week I'll be here at this time with a special guest to look in detail at the stories that are hitting the headlines in our region. Today, it's a pleasure to welcome my reviewer. He's a Lib Dem councillor on West Sussex County Council, also on Worthing Borough Council. Let's say welcome to Bob Smitherman. Bob's currently, by the way, the Worthing Town Crier. Uh, he's a Lib Dem as well, and of course, a Lib Dem councillor is a fairly rare species these days, and cost possibly could be extinct in time. Hello, Bob. How are you? <laughs> Hello, Mike. Good to see you. I certainly I hope we won't be extinct, but um, I'm certainly around for a little while. I, I was managed to get re-elected um, in May of last year. So you're, you will be one of the few that are still there? Um, I, I hope I won't be the last one still standing, but um, I'll still be there for a little while to come, yeah. Okay. Are there elections in Worthing this year? There are indeed. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, on the same day as the general election, May the 7th. Uh huh. Okay, so that, that's what a third of the council, or um, a third of the council. A third of the council. Yeah. And you're up for another three years' time. Um, I've got another three years after that. Yeah. Okay. You feeling confident still? Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident I'll stay there for another three years. <laughs> <laughs> but you got in with a reasonable majority, didn't you? Um, not, not last time actually. It was really? very, I had a very close run thing with UKIP. Despite so. you, you were mayor. Um, despite being mayor, absolutely. I was the only Lib Dem to win, to win a seat in Worthing. So, yeah, it was a tough election for us on the same day as the European election, of course. OK, fingers crossed. OK, let, let's, go, let's go straight into the stories because we've got an awful lot this week. And it has been quite a good news. Well, I say good news, a lot of bad news, but at least there, there's news to discuss. Uh, and the first one is ideal for you, really. Uh, MP is one of the worst dressed men in the world. Uh, this is a story about your friend, uh, Lib Dem MP, Norman Baker, uh, who uh, does look rather strange at times, <laughs> as we can see from some of the photos behind us. Um, <laughs> yes, he, do, he, he does. Norm is a cracking guy, I must admit. This is a lovely, lovely story. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I suppose it's you know, probably, probably sort of fairly sort of typical sort of story this time of year, really, but actually it's a fun story. Norm is a great guy. He's a real individualist, and um, I love him to bits, and I think he's fabulous. And I think, you know, actually stories like this can only help his re-election in May, which, um, and I wish him all the best for retaining his seat. Is, is he a man of principle? Because he resigned his, uh, his candidacy, so. didn't he? Yeah, um, and particularly um, over the issue of David Kelly some time ago after to the Iraq war. Um, obviously, he was one of the Lib Dems with Charles Kennedy that actually opposed the Iraq war. And he really is a man of principle. And he's a very hardworking constituency MP um, up the road here in Lewis. So, um, yeah, no, I wish him all the world. And actually, stories like this can't do him any harm at all. So do you help him with your shoes, his clothing? Um, no, no. Uh, I have to say it's not my style of clothing, but I think it's fabulous. <laughs> OK, uh, let's move on to story number two. Uh, council leader quits his post. This is the story of, of Paul Yallop, who has been leader of Worthing Borough Council for five and a half years now. Mm. Um, actually, you've worked pretty closely with him over the last few years. Indeed, I was leader of the opposition when um, Councillor Yallop took over the leadership from um, um, Keith Mercer. And, um, and actually, I, I always found him very reasonable, um, very, very committed to Worthing, um, obviously very surprised to, um, to hear um, his announcement that's stepping down, but uh, frank, frank, frankly not all that surprised really. As leader of the council, it's a very, very demanding full-time job. Paul's got a young family um, and the allowance system does not allow councillors like Paul with leadership roles to actually um, hold down a full-time job as well. Um, so yeah, I wish him all the very best. I think he's done a great job for Worthing. I think he's done a number of really exciting things like taking on NCP, reducing car parking charges, and I wish him all the very best. Would you say he's got an awful lot to his credit over the last five years? Because it wasn't he one of those who spearheaded the, the joint partnership with, um, with, with he, Worthing he, as well? I think he came in a little bit after that. Mm -hmm. um, that was done by sort of Neil Parkin and Keith Mercer, um, which obviously I posed while I was leader. So Paul came into the sort of next phase of the partnership working, and, and, and actually really drove it forward. And I, and, I, and I think, you know, he obviously was responsible for the external appointment of our um, latest chief executive, Alex, um, who um, is actually really starting to actually take Worthing Lady Councils to the kind of the next phase um, of efficiency savings and, and um, hopefully really good service delivery for our residents. How, how easy is it, and I've been through this myself as you well know, uh, is it to, to keep a job going, to keep a family going and be a councillor at the same time? You, you've got to split yourself into three parts. It, it's, it's really, really difficult. Um, Paul's a young guy like, like, like myself, but he's got a young family, he's got huge commitments. I'm very fortunate, I'm, you, know, I'm, you know, young, free and single, um, pretty cat happy go lucky and I can kind of afford to live on councillors' allowances. Um, but you know, somebody like Paul with a young family, it's very difficult. And um, and I really hope that the, um, the when the independent remuneration panel actually look again at allowances, they will think very seriously about what we're doing to actually attract really quality people like Paul into the role of local government. We've got a situation um, in this country now, as well as locally, where actually 
you know, political party membership is falling, um, and, and actually, therefore, the pool of quality people to come forward as public servants is falling. And actually, we really do need to attract the bright and best in a time where the financial restraints are putting a huge amount of pressure on local government services. So I really hope that we can actually have a proper, honest debate um, about, you know, paying our elected officials because they've got, a, as leader of the council, he, he needs to be available, you know, at the drop of a hat to actually respond to his senior officers who are actually implementing the Conservative administration policies. But, and, um, but, but again, uh, to become a councillor, you don't do it for the money, surely? Of course you don't. I certainly don't do it for the money. But actually, equally, you do need to live. I think the days of having, having councillors who just kind of do it for a bit of a hobby. I, m I remember um, what, one of the first Liberal councillors in Worthing, Bob Clare, um, um, who, who was the only Liberal at the council at the time back in the 70s. He'd served 28 years. But in those days, his employer was very supportive of him um, and he was able to do that. There, there was a legal requirement at one time, wasn't there, that you cannot be fired uh, for going out on council work if you're employed. Absolutely. Whereas um, em emplo em employment is very different now and actually th th there isn't the attraction for large employers like there was in Bob Clare's day mm -hmm. to actually have you know one of your employees as a, as a member of the council. Because at one time council meetings were in the afternoon it was a daytime meeting as opposed Absolutely. to evening uh, therefore employers had to give you the time off mm. uh, and I mean when I was on originally on Hove Council uh, we, all we got was an attendance allowance of 14 pounds. There was nothing yeah. else to it at all. And having you taken an afternoon off work to do that, yeah. it, it really doesn't matter. And I think the problem with that, Mike, is, is, is what, what sort of people do you then attract to the council? In reality, you're probably going to get, you know, you know, a few wealthy retired ex-colonels or, you know, um, you, know, you, know, you know, people who are kind of just doing it, you know, for something to do. Yeah, sure. But actually, local government is far more important than that, in my view. And actually, we need to attract the bright and best into public service. Okay, um, the next story, councillors support bridge ban. Uh, this is a story about uh, horses that went on the brand new Ada Ferry Bridge within days of it actually being opened, mm. uh, who made an awful mess on the bridge. Mm. Uh, but there are no by bylaws to say no horses allowed. And I think West Sussex County Council actually do own the bridge, and you're mm. part of West Sussex County Indeed. Council, are about to vote on whether to stop horses going on there. Yeah, I think this, I think this is um, quite a sad story, really. And, um, and I hope um, horse owners across our patch will look really carefully at this and be responsible when actually they are using our sort of public roads and bridges because actually the reason why horses were allowed on the bridge because it's actually a lot safer for them than being on the Norfolk Bridge on the road. Oh, but it's is safe for the pedestrians though. When you've got horses going across a bridge where you've got a lot of children, you've got uh, bicycles on there because the bridge really was financed by a bicycle uh, mm. organisation. Uh, is it right to mix those? Um, and, and, pr and probably in the light of this, probably not. But I just think it's really sad, actually. I'm a great believer in actually mixing all sorts. I think, you know, we've got a promenade in Worthing where actually cyclists and pedestrians can, can all mix safely together, provided they do it responsibly, really. But when you have a situation which has clearly been abused here, then actually I, you can understand why the local councillors are calling for this traffic regulation order to ban horses. But I just think it's a real shame. And I hope that, you know, the horse fraternity will look at this story and, and and really be responsible in the way that dog owners are and should be about cleaning up after dogs. Actually, if, if horse owners are going to use the public roads, they absolutely should clear up after themselves. I remember as a youngster, I saw my grandfather following behind horses and, and picking up the mess and putting on the roses. Yeah, absolutely. It's very, very good for, for allotments, I hope. Abs absolutely. Mm. And, um, and, and there's absolutely no reason why our sort of horse fraternity should, shouldn't be doing that. You know, they, they, re they should, really should be acting responsibly. And, and, and if they do, the, you know, the, the, the traffic regulation orders like this, which cost the taxpayer a huge amount of money, and I'm not a big fan of regulation particularly, um, you know, as the coalition government isn't, is looking at actually deregulation. Actually, this is just another bit of red tape, really, which I think could probably have been avoided. OK, uh, let's go to another story before the break, and this is parking costs amongst the highest in the UK. Uh, this is Brighton and Hove Council, uh, the highest in the country. Uh, yeah, not not the, a good sign for Brighton and uh, Hove. No, it's not. I, I, and, and of course, the Green Council here in Brighton have got an appalling record on, um, on parking. I th I, and, and I'm not quite sure why, why they've done it. I'm, I'm sure you, you have Green councillors on, on here that will defend the, the price of parking. Um, we, we had incredibly high parking um, as a result of the NCP contract, which we've now um, got rid of in Worthing. We've now introduced pounds an hour parking, and, and our car parks are filling up. 
Um, and, and I think, and I think, actually, you know, ha having a record like this in Brighton is just crazy, really. And and, and actually, I, th I think what we have to do as politicians is actually look at the benefits from reduced parking in terms of the wider economy. I think actually by having reduced parking, like we've done in Worthing, it's actually, worth for Worthing, hasn't it? It's worth for Worthing. We, we, you know, our car parks are now increasing. We've still got a long way to go, um, but but actually, we've got more and more people that you, that are coming off the street. And we perhaps might be talking about that later, about you know, people parking on the street. But people are coming off the street, parking in our car parks, staying longer, spending more money in our restaurants, shops and cafes, which is fabulous for the local economy. And of course, a parking charge in Worthing, you're only a pound an hour. Exactly. And, and, um, and, and I think that's one of the things which is a credit to um, the former leader of the council, Paul Yellup. OK, time for a break. When we return, we look at other stories that are hitting uh, our, our newspapers in our region. Uh, this, of course, is the Week in Review. My guest is Lib Dem councillor Bob Smitherman. Uh, we've got a lot more stories to go through, as you mentioned there. Again, more parking stories. <laughs> um, we've got stories about a, a pregnant woman who wasn't allowed to go to the loo, which was a little bit strange. Don't go away, we'll see you after the break. This is Mike Mendoza and the newspaper in review. Welcome back to the newspapers and the week in review with me, Mike Mendoza. And my guest is Lib Dem Council on both West Sussex County Council and Worthing Council, and that's Bob Smitherman. Welcome back. Thank you, Mike. Good to see you again. I love the yellow tie today, Mike. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is, I know it's election year, but this is a bit ridiculous. Uh, really. No, I, I wear yellow ties all the time. I've got, I a, whole wardrobe all the time. I've got a wardrobe <laughs> full of them. <laughs> Do you wear yellow suits as well? Um, no, I haven't quite gone down that far yet. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave that sort of thing to Norman. I'm going to say, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's look at some other stories. This is the headline in, in the Argus uh, this week. It also made the national papers as well, by the way. Um, this is uh, an interesting story. It's about a pregnant woman who was banned from uh, being allowed to go to the toilet. Um, this is a pregnant woman who was barred from using the toilets in a fast food restaurant for not having a receipt, although her husband, in fact, was queuing up to, to buy a burger at the time. Oh. This is in, uh, I think, North Street or North Road in, in Brighton, North Street. I, th I, th I think this is a typical Jobsworth story. I'm not surprised the Nationals have picked it up, and rightly so. You, you know, we should, we should be. I, I, I've worked in burger bars. I've worked in customer service. Actually, it's good customer service to be letting anybody use the toilet. You know, even even if they're not buying, but, but even mm. if they're not actually buying food on that particular occasion, I think it's just good customer service. And and this is an example of very poor customer service and um, I really hope that actually the manager of this particular Burger King is severely reprimanded for this. This is giving a huge, you know, it's terrible PR, Burger dis King for terrible start, PR really? disaster yeah. for yeah. Burger King and I really hope their manager is reprimanded for this. Um, you know, this should just not be tolerated. But in, in a main road like that, I mean, there's, there's an awful lot of people who go down that road. Absolutely. It's a main thoroughfare. Should, should restaurants or, or anywhere be just available for, for people to go to the toilet. I, I, I guess also local authority is to blame for not providing adequate facilities. Um, yeah, I think, I think it comes back to the issue about sort of, um, you, you know, local authority funding. You know, there's no statutory requirement for local authorities to provide public conveniences. Um, I think one of the Lib Dem councillors actually led the way a few years ago in actually having a community toilet scheme, which actually enabled, it's one of the things I proposed in Worthing a few years ago. Sadly, the Conservatives didn't agree with me, but actually we could, I think community toilet schemes are fantastic because actually the local authority provide funding to restaurants like this to actually provide this as a public facility. Can you explain what a community toilet is? Because at the moment my mind is going over time. <laughs> yes. I mean, we all hold hands and go to the toilet together. Um, no, it's, yeah. not, it's not quite like that. Yeah. But um, a community toilet scheme, it started in um, Lib Dem run Richmond Council some years ago, and it's basically where the local authority provide funding to um, participating outlets, um, which include restaurants like this, hotels and so on, for members of the public to go to the toilet. So hence saving the local authority a huge amount of money on providing the provision themselves, and actually, most importantly, providing a very important facility that we all need um, in our community. Um, and and um, for those that have been to Richmond, it's a great scheme. And um, I really hope that we can you know, one day roll out schemes like this again and we can avoid stories like this. Have you, have you got uh, any public toilets in Worthing? I know you've got one next to the pier. Um, yeah, we've got a few. We, got, um, we closed quite a few public toilets um, when the Conservatives took control from the Lib Dems some years ago. Um, and um, the, the, the financial reality is we're never going to be in a situation to open those again. Um, so that, that was why I proposed the community toilet scheme. Because you know, I am a realist. It's not just about opposing. And everyone's going to go, haven't they? Absolutely. We're all we're, we're all going to be there. And I propose what was you know I thought to be a realistic possible solution. There's a model in Richmond for community toilets, and I think it's a it's great. And we really need to avoid stories like this. Certainly, our McDonald's 
Um, I've got a very good system where the toilets are regularly monitored by staff to make sure they're not misused in a busy thoroughfare. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I think Burger King needs to actually take heed of that and actually be monitoring their toilets and, and be reasonable with the members of the public. I mean, in the centre of London, uh, Cambridge Circus and, and various areas around Soho, they've got these pop-up toilets. Have you, I don't know if you've seen these. Yeah. They actually come out the ground, I think it's eight or nine o'clock at night, mm. and they go back underground again sort of about five or six in the morning. Yeah. I mean, it's a good idea. It stops people doing their business in, in people's doorways. Absolutely, and I, th and I, th and I think what, that's one of the things which I'm hoping will happen in um, Goring and by the Yacht Club as part of the new development in Goring. Oh, pop -up yeah, we, mm. we, we lost um, the community, um, the um, um, old toilet Public facilities, yeah. which, mm. which were misused, um, and actually as part of the, um, the development brief that I agreed back some time ago for that development was actually making sure the toilets were reinstated with the new development, and certainly talking to Keir Holmes, that's one of the things that I was urging them to do, was have some sort of pop-up toilet for people using the seafront in that area of Goring, which I think would be great. Okay, let's move on to another story. Uh, schools shock. More than a 1,000 pupils suspended for violent attacks in just one year. Is this because of lack of discipline in the schools now that teachers are scared to, to tell the kids off? Um, I think it probably sadly is. I think this, this, is, this really is a shocking story. Um, certainly, certainly when I was at school, we had corporal punishment. Um, and, you know, you, know, for, for, you know, for very minor things, I was sent to the head's office. We used to be made to stand outside, you know, for the head who, who, would, who would arrive after keeping you waiting for about an hour, which was humiliating in itself, mm. only to go in for about five minutes where he'd give you a good, a good stern talking to, a whack over the back of the hand or somewhere else with the, um, with the slipper, which was hanging on his door. And um, none of us wanted to be back there again. So I think there's a huge case for proportionate, reasonable corporal punishment in our schools. Um, and I suspect that's probably not going to be very popular with, um, with viewers. But I really do think we need to get back to having some sort of discipline in our schools. Do you remember that? Um, I don't know if you remember, I don't know if you had it in your days, uh, where, where the teacher would be with, with, the, with the eraser on the, on, the, on the board and he'd throw it at you if you, if you were Absolutely. Sort of, yeah, seemed, seemed yeah, yeah I'd, I'd had that thrown at me um, in my class. But I think the, the, the worrying thing about a story like this, it's back on, on the back of a story a week or so ago um, when we had the same thing was happening in our hospitals where you know, public servants are doing an important job, whether it be educating our children or last week, treating people in A&E, only to be attacked by members of the public. And I think for young people to be doing this does not bode well for the future, really. So I think you know, this is something that our politicians really do need to look at. OK, and the next story is really on a, on a similar uh, vein. Uh, back to Borstal, a new TV show. Uh, it's about a prison teacher is <coughs> swapping the modern jail system for a 1930s-style Borstal to help young offenders. These are kids, actually, by the way, who have sort of taken the wrong route in life, who have volunteered to be part of this television show. Uh, they got the option to leave if they they want to, but they're treated like the good old days of Borsal, and most of them did stay. I think very few actually walked out. Mm. But I, I mean, Borsal, should we be going back to Borsal? Uh, it's, really, it's a really interesting story, actually, this one. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think one of the problems with our current prison system at the moment is um, we've got what's the revolving door. You know, you know, people are going in, they're staying there for a few months, they're coming out, and they're committing the same crime over and over again. And we have to address that. Um, whether Borstal is the right idea, I don't know, but I think anything that we can use to rehabilitate you know, people who have got themselves into the criminal justice system, you know, to rehabilitate them and get them back you know, being productive members of society has to be a good thing. But we so do have young offenders institutes at the moment, surely that is very similar. Um, but yes, quite possibly. Um, I don't, and I think, I think you know, whatever you call it, I don't know, but I think actually, I think this is a really, really good opportunity um, to actually end the revolving door of um, the criminal justice system where you know y youngsters are going in for sort of fairly petty crimes coming out going back in for something slightly more substantial and uh, and we need to end that and actually you know you know we've all taken the wrong path path in various parts of our lives but actually we need to make sure that our young people we end that really so um, i think it's worth looking at OK, uh, next one, tributes to veteran who stole the heart of the nation. Uh, this is a story of Bernie Jordan, who, of course, uh, ran away to France uh, during the last uh, commemorations, um, went over to Normandy, made a, a secret dash over yes. there. Uh, really, the whole nation took him to their hearts. Absolutely. Uh, sadly, he passed away uh, a few days ago. And even as sad as that, his, his wife, Irene, or Rini, uh, passed away yesterday as well. So they're both sadly gone. But it's, it's, it's a wonderful story about a wonderful man. And I worked with him for many, many years. Years. Uh, in fact, he was uh, virtually my, my mentor when I first joined Hove Council because he was mayor of, of Hove at one okay. time. And I noticed yesterday the tribute that was played by the, by the mayor of Brighton, uh, Brian Fitch, 
who mentioned that uh, Bernie had been mayor of the city. He'd never been mayor of the city. He was actually mayor of Hove mm -hmm. prior to becoming of a course. city. Yeah, but a wonderful man, a great story. Indeed, it's, it's, a, lo it's a lovely story, this, Mike. I, I must admit, I think all of us can probably relate to something like this. You know, you know just because you're getting old, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, that, that actually you don't feel some of the passions from your past. I could imagine actually my mum or dad doing something like this when they're in a nursing home. Mm. You know, you know, my mum's my mum's sad in a nursing home at the moment and uh, and she's desperate to get out and do some of the things that she can remember for, you know, from, from, from her younger days. So I think it's just a lovely, lovely story. And of course, all our, all our, you know, thoughts are with them. He's, he's sort of family at this sad time. But what a, what a fantastic life. You know, and um, and actually, it's, it's, it's a, this to me is a sort of celebration story, really, yeah, of a very yeah. lovely, lovely, lovely man, it's and, um, and, 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 a, and a great public servant. Oh, um, yes, and yeah. obviously, local government is obviously we talked about local government earlier. Local government's very much changed since Bernie's days, um, but, but 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 you know, um, and, and probably rightly so. But but actually, it's important that modern councillors today look back fondly and with and huge respect for what um, our, our sort of predecessor councillors And then there's a man who was a staunch conservative all his life, suddenly decided to become a Labour, uh, and then joined Lib Dem. So he's been around. Oh, it's very interesting. <laughs> I think he, we got time. He, maybe he saw the light at the end. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we got time for a very, very quick story. This is the cover of the Brighton Hove Independent, uh, Pavements for Pedestrians. This is their own campaign. I think also you're doing a campaign, aren't you, on this? Um, yes, this is something that, um, which is, I know been very close to um, the heart of residency in my own area, Tarring. Um, um, and we've been campaigning on this for a long time. Um, Lib Dem um, MP for Cheltenham, Martin Horwood, has got um, a private member's bill, I believe, mightn't be today, um, certainly coming up very shortly, about doing um, in the rest of the country what happens in London and has been happened for years. It's a, it's a criminal offence in London to park on a pavement. And actually, you know, um, Marty's bill would actually roll that out across the country. Um, Parking on pavements, as you can see by some of the pictures in the Independent here, is, is, is actually... We're out of time. We're going to catch you next time. Certainly it's all time we have today. Bob Smith, and thank you so much indeed. Please come back and do the National Papers. Oh, very, very well. well. Thank, thank you so much, nice We'll be back next time with the newspapers and the Week in Review. Mm.